been doing, then it signals the tyrants to have their way, and we've got to stop that. Now, I want to, uh, may I inquire how much time is remaining? Gentleman has 25 minutes left. Thank you. Wanted to shift gears because we've been doing so much talking about the continuing resolution, which is just an ongoing funding of the way things are going, except for amendments that have been adopted to the CR. Um, and we've talked so much about um, health care and the president's bill that many call Obamacare. And in the CR that was debated for over 90 hours, um, with an open rule until a unanimous consent agreement was reached, you know, 80 hours or so into the debate. Um, it was the first open rule we'd had like that in years. Uh, certainly, um, we didn't have such an open debate and an open rule during the last two years, uh, during the Democrats' control of the majority in both the House and the Senate, we didn't have an open rule here. And we were advised that it was the first time in America's history that there was not an open rule where you could bring anybody, could bring amendments to the floor and offer them to a bill. Now, it's not a pretty thing to watch, all that debate going back and forth. And, and I know I hear some people say, you know, you guys shouldn't bicker so much back and forth. But they show a lack of knowledge about what the founders intended. Uh, and Justice Scalia put it so well to a group when one asked, do we have more freedom in America because we have the best Bill of Rights in history? And Scalia, with as only he could do, abruptly said, basically, well, no, even the Soviet Union had a better Bill of Rights than we do. And I'd forgotten, but back in college, during one of my history and uh, world courses, I'd written a paper on the Soviet government and their constitution, their Bill of Rights. And Justice Scalia was exactly right. They had more promises in their Bill of Rights than we do. But as Justice Scalia so aptly pointed out, the reason we have more freedoms in America than any country in history is because the founders did not trust government. So they put as many impediments in the path of creating laws as they could. Because they knew if they made it too easy to pass laws, then it would be too easy to subjugate Americans and take away their freedom and have the government get bigger and bigger until they basically took away pe people's freedom and their way of life that, to which they'd become accustomed. They knew that. They'd seen that. They'd learned that from their vast reading of history. They had such great knowledge of the, the writings of the philosophers and historians. They understood all that. They did not trust government. So they were not going to be satisfied to have one house as a representative body because it might be too easy for one body, one group to take over control of that one house and then ramrod through all types of uh, oppressive legislation like Obamacare, for example. So they were so worried about that, they created a second house of representatives ended up being called the Senate, and they were selected a different way by the state legislators uh, so that they would be responsible to the state legislators so that they wouldn't end up taking away states' rights and certainly wouldn't allow the House of Representatives to take away states' rights. So they thought, gee, two houses. But even that wasn't good enough because they realized you know, we could do like has been done before and have a prime minister elected by the legislative body and he'd be the top executive. It's not good enough. It's not enough of an impediment or an obstacle to passing laws. We still want to make it harder to pass laws. So let's create a separate executive branch and have the executive, the top executive, the president elected 
by the entire country and uh, at least elected by the entire com country's representatives. But that was going to be a different format. And then they set up the judiciary branch. And both the president could veto, and even the judiciary, as it turned out, was going to be able to veto things if it got through the House and Senate and yet took away some constitutional right. They thought they created a good enough system that wouldn't be as abused as the entire system was in the last few years. They could not have imagined that a 2,900-page bill, Obamacare, could have been crammed down the throats of American citizens that poll after poll showed did not want it. They would never have imagined that the Senate would not be independent enough and would be take, so taken over by one political extremist group that they would pass through such an oppressive bill that would force a government takeover and government control of everybody's health care that would force every American to have their medical records sent to a central repository that supposedly General Electric would handle because they're good cronies with this administration. And they would take care of every American's records because the federal government would have control of all of that. And not only that, they would take control over all the health care insurance companies. They would take control over uh, ordering what would be allowable under health care, what would not be allowable under health care, all in this massive bill that would provide for supposedly hundreds of thousands of regulations that would follow to interpret those, those uh, 2,900 pages. They could never have imagined that it would get that bad in this country, that the system they created to throw obstacles in the path of government creating laws that the American people did not want, and certainly not that a majority of Americans didn't want, and by golly, they got it through. They rammed it through. They used carrots. They dangled benefits. They um, added all kinds of pork to bills. They threw in something for the big pharmaceuticals. They threw something for the trial lawyers. They threw something in for the uh, AMA. They certainly threw a big juicy bone in for ARP. Well, a bunch of juicy bones, actually. Uh, they threw all these things in for all these interest groups except for the one who poll after poll said, we don't want it. Don't do this. You promised us you would negotiate a health care bill on C-SPAN, and we would be able to see who was out for the people. So all the people could assume was that because none of that was done on C-SPAN, other than uh, a dog and pony show after it was basically done and about to be crammed down Republicans' throats anyway, we had a little summit. Um, and it got crammed down our throats anyway, and Americans didn't want it. Well, I did go through the original 1,000-page bill. I went through the 2,000-page bill. I put off going through the 2,900-page bill, because who knew if there would be a third or fourth, I mean a fourth or fifth on top of that. I didn't want to end up going through yet another bill that wasn't going to be the one that really was... Uh, the one that was seriously going to be made law. So I put it off. And when I got around to going through and reading the 2,900-page bill, you know, I'll admit, I, I was wanting to look at what the sections did, their effect. And so I was struck by finding really ingenious or insidious uh, language and, and um, drafting provisions, depending on your viewpoint, for example, with abortion, there was a section there saying, you know, you couldn't have um, uh, federal funds for abortion, but over in the section that was going to allow it, instead of mentioning the word abortion, it just referred to the section. So if you went online and did a word search for the word abortion, you wouldn't see all of the provisions that allowed for abortion and federal funding. 
you would only find a restricted group. That kind of really clever uh, hiding what was going on. I passed over a lot of the numbers uh, that were utilized, and so it was a bit surprising to find out here recently, and going back through, and uh, Ernie Ince took a uh, former member here that I served with, now with the Heritage Foundation, uh, yesterday provided me with copies of specific pages of the bill. And again, um, this is Public Law 111-148 and 111-152. Um, but if you looked at, um, let's see, Consolidated Print-26, here it says down here, there is a pro hereby appropriated to the Secretary out of any funds in the Treasury not otherwise appropriated $30 million for the first fiscal year. And it goes on, and another page says uh, there are hereby appropriated to the trust fund the following, and it appropriated $10 million for this, $50 million for that, $150 million for that, uh, another $150 million, another $150 million. And you, you go through these, and it's staggering how much money was actually not authorized, but they used appropriating language. Because as many people know, and I'm finding more and more that are watching C-SPAN, but they know, gee, normally you have a budget. Well, there was no budget last year. The majority didn't want people to see exactly how the money would be budgeted. So they didn't bother with one in election year. First time in decades, as I understand it. But we didn't have a budget, and then we had this uh, beginning of this continuing resolution stuff. But normally, you'll have a budget, you'll have an authorization for expenditure, but then it had to be followed up with an appropriation. Well, Obamacare went straight to it and appropriated vast amounts of money, and in fact, in this first year of 2011, fiscal year 2011, there's $4,951,000,000 appropriated in the bill. They apparently not only overran all the obstacles and hurdles that the founders put in our way to come up so that we would not come up with legislation that Americans did not want, they overcame that, and then just to make sure that it would be difficult to ever stop this by unfunding it, they actually didn't just authorize, they appropriated $105,464,000,000 in this Obamacare bill. A hundred and over $105 billion from 2011 through 2019, 105 billion. Now, the rules get a little complicated around here, and any amendment that seeks to rescind a prior appropriation is going to be subject to a point of order objection and not be allowed because it legislates in an appropriating bill, and under our rules, you can't legislate an appropriating bill. So the only way, and these people that put this language in here, they knew it. When they were telling America, we know we're broke, we've got to rein in spending, all the while they were sticking in $105 billion of spending in one bill. Not authorizing, not saying, gee, you may not be able to afford this five or six, seven years from now. So instead, they just said, we're appropriating it, and you can't do anything about it because under the House rules, you try to bring up an amendment to rescind that. It's subject to a point of order objection, and we can keep it from coming out. The only way that I understand that this $105 billion that's now been appropriated by the last Congress, the only way that can be taken out is to have a provision in the original bill from the appropriators, not an amendment, a provision that rescinds 
this $105 billion of appropriations in this prior law from last year, and it's in the original bill, and then the Rules Committee waives any point of order objections to that rescission being in the appropriating bill. My understanding is that's the only way we can get it done. The amendments we were trying to do and that we got done apparently are not going to accomplish that. We're going to have to have it in an original committee bill rescinding all of this massive amount of money. And right now we'll be borrowing 42 cents of every dollar of that $105 billion. It's irresponsible. It's almost inconceivable, except here it is in black and white in front of us. America deserves better than this. You know, I, I told some folks back home, I've mentioned before, it strikes me that this government in the last, not just four years, but even going back into the last few years, and especially the TARP bailout that was such a disaster and should never have been passed, that this government it became like a parent who had an overwhelming desire to spend and could not control their own spending. So the, the parent goes to the bank and says, you've got to loan me massive amounts of money. And the bank says, how are you going to pay it back? You're not going to live long enough to ever pay this back. And the parent says, no, but I've got my children here, and they're going to have children, and those children will have children. So my children, my grandchildren, my great-grandchildren, I'm pledging they're going to pay back all of this self-centered massive amounts of money I'm throwing upon me and my friends, and I'm pledging and promising my children will be indentured servants for the rest of their lives because I can't stop spending. Now, in a case like that, you'd probably have the Child Protective Service come swooping in and say, you are an unfit parent. You have no business having children, when you are selling your children's future for your own use of money now, how irresponsible that is. Do you care nothing about the children that you can't quit lavishing all that money and paying your friends for doing nothing? You can't control your spending so that your children and grandchildren and great-grandchildren can have freedom like you had it? You can't control that. You're an irresponsible ch parent, and you shouldn't even have these children if you're going to do that. I mean, I've heard Child Protective Services in Texas come in on a lot weaker claims to take children away from parents than that. It's irresponsible what we're doing, and to, to pass a bill that was against the vast majority will of the American people and to stick in $105 billion of spending is just irresponsible. It's got to stop. On one final note, before my time concludes, having been a judge and a state chief justice, I'm sensitive when I hear judges threatened, and especially in the wake of Gabby Gifford's shooting and the loss of life in Arizona. We really should not be provoking actions to the point of violence or threatening, threatening actions. And I've certainly had my share of death threats as a judge. But it was usually when they, only when they included my family that it got serious. And we have a group that's held itself out for years now, Common Cause, as this wonderful nonpartisan group. And yet you see over and over, like you did here recently with the, the rally they held in California um, with um, Van Jones, such an impassioned socialist, um, speaking and stirring people up against Justice Thomas and Justice Scalia. Justice Thomas himself 
after one of the most um, embarrassing episodes in American history, the way he was treated as he went through the hearings for confirmation to the Supreme Court. He said himself, you know, it's a modern-day lynching, high-tech lynching. And in his book, My Grandfather's Son, where he describes coming out of poverty, severe poverty, and making it on nothing but hard work and his brilliant intellect, he achieved the great heights he has. And that you know, I've heard him say himself, you know, he, he started out in college as an angry black man, left-wing extremist, who came to realize more oppressive government is not the answer. But he also came to see firsthand, as he, he has described it, that if you're an African-American and you spout the words that the liberal left tells you to say, then they love you. But if you dare, as he points out, otherwise I wouldn't use these words, but he says, if you dare to step off the plantation and think for yourself, then here comes all the groups that come after you. And we have seen that with this attack from Common Cause that they are using to fundraise this, this attack after Justice Thomas and Scalia. And I, again, look for evidence. Are they nonpartisan? Well, it seems like they only come after uh, conservatives, mainstream Americans, but they encourage left-wing extremism on, on a wholesale basis. But to be attacking Justice Thomas and Scalia and stir up sentiment. I mean, they sent out the emails urging people to come. They sent out the notices of what they were doing urging people to come. They knew who they were sending those to. They urged these people to come. And what they got were the friends that they had invited saying they wanted to string up, basically lynch, one of the most honorable people in America, Clarence Thomas, that came from a most oppressive background and fought and worked his way up, as he would tell you, with the help of loving grandparents to the status that he has. And they want to do a high-tech lynching of him now, except the people that they stirred up aren't going to be satisfied with high-tech. They want to lynch him. They want to lynch his wife. And when you look for evidence, well, if they've been saying this all along about other incidences that were similar, well... When we got a national leader of the ACLU, they never mentioned one word about perhaps she should recuse herself from things that involve the ACLU. And, and our sympathies go out in the loss of any time anyone loses a spouse. But when people on the Supreme Court who came from leftist backgrounds uh, had spouses that had direct interests that were affected, uh, common Cause was silent. Oh, no, we, they raised their money on going after people that are mainstream conservatives and believe in the Constitution, meaning what it says. And after bringing this up at a, at a press of, um, conference this afternoon, we get word that Common Cause has come out and said, we apologize. We never meant for them to say that. No, actually, that's not what they said. They came out and said, this is laughable. Didn't come out and condemn people that want to lynch a Supreme Court justice or justices and their spouses, family, and do torture them, do these terrible things. No, I didn't say anything about that. Just said this is laughable because they're still raising money and it's time the Justice Department started being fair about justice and not just us at their Justice Department, but looked into common cause and looked at whether they really deserve to be called not-for-profit and nonpartisan because what they're doing to stir up Americans against honorable Americans is intolerable. America deserves better. The, the adage is democracy ensures America deserves, uh, uh, any country, democracy ensures that people are governed no better than they deserve. My hope and prayer is we deserve better. 
in the next election. And with that, I yield back. Gentleman yields back. Under the Speaker's announced policy of January 5, 2011, the gentleman from Ohio, Mr. Kucinich, is recognized for 60 minutes as the designee of the Minority Leader. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Today in the state of Ohio, the state of Wisconsin, the state of Indiana, there are epic struggles underway where those who serve the public, who teach our children, who police our streets, who fight the fires, who perform a myriad of services at a state, county, and municipal level are under attack. Their wages are under attack. Their benefits are under attack. Their pensions, their working conditions, and these public workers are being made the scapegoats in all of the budget challenges which states face. They're now blaming the workers. Our whole economy has been turned into a somewhat efficient engine that takes the wealth of the American people and accelerates the wealth to the top. That, after all, is what our tax system is about. That's what Wall Street is about. That's what banking is about. That's what our energy policy is about, taking the wealth of millions, giving it to the, a few oil companies. If you examine every area of our economy, you'll see that we're at a time in the history of America where the rich truly are getting richer, the poor are getting poorer, and the middle class is getting destroyed. Enter public workers, people who have dedicated their lives to public servants, people who are truly public servants in the truest sense of the word, people who were told that if they agreed to public service that they would have certain guarantees, and so they dedicated their lives. Ohio has had a new governor, a person who I serve with in this House. And from the moment he has come into office, he and his supporters have run an agenda that is aimed at vitiating the rights of public workers. And this has resulted yesterday in the passage by a single vote in the Ohio Senate of SB5, a bill that will strip collective bargaining rights just about across the board from public workers, that would take away public employees' right to strike, that would make the pen penalty for a strike removal with replacement workers, that will open the door to privatization of services, now, my read of what's going on in Ohio, which is my home state, is this, that by attempting to crush public workers, by telling them you will not have any abil ability to negotiate your benefits, you will not have any ability to negotiate your working conditions, uh, your health benefits, your pension, uh, these provisions are not subject to discussion. The number of people working with you at any time, not subject to discussion. That what's happened is that we have seen accomplished an economic attack on workers, which will lead to them working for less, but opening the door to privatization scheme, which, Mr. Speaker, works like this. You make public workers the issue. You say that they're paid too much when, you know, I have here a uh, uh, matter for the record from the Economic Policy Institute, which says that Ohio public sector workers are undercompensated compared to private sector counterparts. 
but facts unfortunately mean little in this debate. But you tell the public that these public workers are overpaid. And then what you say, and this new law, Senate Bill 5, would, make, would enable the state of Ohio to do this, you then say, well, you know, we're going to privatize this section of the workforce. We're going to put the work out for bids. We'll get a private company in here to do it. And, oh, we promise it'll be done more efficiently. And while well, the taxpayers then go to sleep, they wake up one day and they discover that what's happened is this, that they have permitted a privatization of their services and they end up inevitably paying more and getting less. The corporations walk away with the profits. The privatized workers get paid less in order to enable the corporations to make more money. So ultimately, what Senate Bill 5 in Ohio will do is end up costing the state government even more. It's not going to be any savings when you set the stage for a weakening of workers, when you set the stage for making it illegal for them to strike and then knocking them out with replacement workers and then setting things on a path to privatization. That's what this bill is about. You look in Wisconsin, and I believe it was Paul Krugman and others who pointed out that in Wisconsin there was a provision in the Wisconsin uh, budget where from the governor of Wisconsin's bill, uh, it says sale or contractual operation of state-owned heating, cooling, and power plants, saying that the department may sell any state-owned heating, cooling, and power plant or may contract with a private entity of the operation of any such plant with or without solicitation or bids. So you could have a private contractor just give it away without any bids at all. They're, they're power plants that serve facilities in the state of Wisconsin. This is the kind of thing that we can expect in Ohio, except that in this case we're talking about the privatization of public services. Now privatization of public services is, uh, in a way, it's well established here already, unfortunately. And it, um, uh, the AFL cio Public Employee Department produced a paper which talks about when you get into privatization, the public ends up having really little accountability on the question of public funds. Uh, and they point out that private business has no business allocating public funds or monitoring the use of public funds. There's a question of fiscal accountability. Look, we know that when there are massive amounts of money available that it goes from the public sector to the private sector, let's take, let's take Iraq or Afghanistan with respect to contracts, billions of dollars disappear, get wasted. It ends up being a racket. Reduce it to a state level and you have the potential for fraud. You have the a weakening of the community ability to assert collective interests and as I said the, res the resulting savings that taxpayers are being told will occur are actually directed to the corporation so they can get higher profits. Privatization is inevitably a racket. When as a member of Congress in my home district in Cleveland the Defense P Finance Administration wanted to privatize a number of accounting jobs in Cleveland. Mr. Speaker, I had a seven-year battle with the Defense Finance Administration where we proved that the taxpayers were getting taken for a ride in this privatization plan that was being promoted by our government to the tune of tens of millions of dollars. We reversed the privatization. Privatization is at the core of this battle in Ohio because the assets of the state are worth countless billions of dollars. 
If you could take a workforce, there's over 300,000, about 350,000 public workers in Ohio would be affected by SB 5. There is not a service that can't be privatized. But then the public doesn't have any control over it. They can't call up their elected official and complain about a service that's privatized. They have to call up the corporation. And they end up paying more in taxes. People need to understand that. States have budget difficulties they have to deal with. I got that. I understand that. States, under, states need a revenue sharing plan from the federal government, but the federal government doesn't have the money right now. Why doesn't the federal government have the money? Well, how about the fact that the federal government is spending trillions of dollars on wars one of which is based on lies, the other one's based on a misreading of history. Joseph Stiglitz, Nobel Prize winning economist, in his book with Linda Billmas called The Three Trillion Dollar War, has, has stated that the cost of the war in Iraq will run between three and five trillion dollars, just to the U.S. taxpayers. The cost of the war in Afghanistan is already over a half a trillion dollars. The long-term cost of that, since we're still in a period of acceleration of that war, will certainly go into the trillions of dollars. We saw a couple of years ago Wall Street come to this capital, suddenly the waves parted. $700 billion in loans when Wall Street was flagging. That could have been anticipated that Wall Street would create incredible speculation when Glass-Steagall was effectively repealed, when they took down the wall that separated commercial from investment banking. Those who were the cops on the beat kind of walked away while this bubble was building on mortgage-backed securities. Hedge funds speculating, speculating, inflating the bubble. It burst and all Americans got hurt but all Americans didn't get made whole. Most Americans have experienced a 30% drop in the value of their mortgages while Wall Street is enjoying record profits once again. While Wall Street once again is experiencing high salaries and high bonuses. Not on Main Street though. On Main Street you have 15 million unemployed, 12 million underemployed, 50 million people without health insurance, 10 to 12 million people's homes have been in jeopardy. So then you go back to the so then you go back to the state level where states are pressed, but states are pressed in part because of the mismanagement of our national economy, and because we have a monetary policy that has worked for Wall Street, but it certainly hasn't worked for Main Street. So by the time this debate gets down to a state level. Those executives who are more inclined towards a corporate point of view are saying, look, easy, we'll just knock out the public unions. But there are serious implications to this type of thinking. Because what we're actually doing is we're setting aside an entire struggle that's been part of America's history that we should all be proud of. The civil rights movement is part of America's history we should be proud of. The civil rights movement which resulted in constitutional changes which recognized the rights of all citizens as being equal, truly equal. The, citizen, the civil rights movement which accorded women an equal place in our society with respect, of course, with the exception of pay, but nevertheless, the potential for an equal role in our society is something we should be proud of. <clears throat> With that civil rights movement, the labor movement moved apace. And that labor movement was about lifting everyone up, <clears throat> not just those who were members of union. 
unions came about because workers were being crushed. They were working in awful working conditions. They were subjected to a forms of slave labor. They were working long hours and paid very little. They were working under conditions which put their, put their lives at jeopardy. America had a tradition of child labor at one time. All that changed with the laws that were passed in this chamber. We should be proud of what America has been able to accomplish in lifting up the status of working people in our society so that you could have an eight-hour day, so that you could have a safe workplace, so much so that today we understand that intimately linked to the very nature of our democracy is the right to collective bargaining, the very right that's under attack in Ohio and Wisconsin and Indiana and other states across this union. The right to collective bargaining is being able to assert a First Amendment right of, of association, it's to be able to assert that workers have a sense of agency, that in a society where capital can be amassed in tremendous sums, one individual has the right to be able to assert his or her rights because they have representation, because there's a law that says they have the ability to be able to have an influence on how much they're paid, on what their benefits, and on what their working conditions would be. That's the essence of what it means to be a democracy, that workers have a say, that it's not top-down. This isn't a dictatorship. And yet SB 5 sets the stage for a kind of dictatorship. Top-down, these are your working conditions, take it or leave it. These are your benefits, take it or leave it. Don't ask any questions, shut up and go to work. When did America buy into that? Because the minute we buy into that kind of mentality, how does that separate us from what's happening in China? I want people to focus on this for a minute. We passed a trade agreement with China, which has China trade, which I voted against, without any provisions for workers' rights, human rights, or environmental quality principles. I had some paper workers in my office from Washington State a month ago, and they showed me how many jobs in their industry have moved out of Washington and how many plants for their industry opened up in China. It's, it's amazing to look at a map and to see, well, they're here once, and now these same jobs are in China. Well, China workers don't have any rights. There's no right to collective bargaining in China. They don't, that's not part of the discussion. The government of China is run under a different philosophy. Workers don't have a right to strike in China. There's no right to decent wages or benefits. Oh, yes, it's called communist China, excuse me. As part of a democracy, we assert and have a right to assert that workers here do have a right to collective bargaining. They have a right to join a union. They have a right to strike. They have a right to decent wages and benefits. They have a right to a secure retirement. They have a right to a safe workplace, a right to be able to challenge legally an employer who maintains an unsafe workplace. They have a right to participate in the political process. So many of these rights are under attack at a state level today. And this has an effect not just on public workers, but on all workers. Because if America begins to take down the hard-earned rights of workers, in, in, whether it's in the public sector or the private sector, if we begin to take that down and we try to justify it, here's what we can look forward to. We can look forward to lower wages. We can look forward to people having zero health benefits we can look forward to people having zero pensions. We can look forward to workplaces becoming less safe. And we can look forward to becoming a little bit like our trading partner in China, which, by the way, has about a $200 billion trade advantage with the United States out of a, a 
trade deficit that's in excess of $450 billion. So are we exporting our democracy? Are we importing values that are estranged from a democratic society? That's really the question that we have to ask ourselves. If we think that what happens in Wisconsin doesn't relate to us, if we think that what happens in Ohio is none of our business. Mr. Speaker, I went to Columbus, Ohio and stood with thousands of workers. I stood with firemen and policemen and teachers. I stood with people who care for the children and seniors. These people are people who have dedicated their whole lives to public service. They have a middle class standard of living because they had that dedication. They're people who are not our enemies. They're our friends, they're our neighbors, and they serve us. Since when are we now faced with looking at those who serve us as being opposed to us? How did our country get that way? Why can't we come to an understanding we have a collective interest here? And why can't our governors tell the truth about what's really happening? that states are getting strangled because of policies at a federal level that are making it much more difficult for states to be able to get any assistance at all. I have not run into any single labor leader who said that they did not want to negotiate the issues that are at hand. I've not run into any labor leader who didn't understand. State budgets are tight, and they want to make sure that states can meet their, the needs of all people. But this top-down approach, this political approach to dictating what state workers, that, what their conditions are, and what their rights are, uh, this sets the stage for an estrangement of people from their own government. So we have to look at the issue of collective bargaining. And in the state of Ohio, we have to understand that the fact that they had collective bargaining makes strikes less likely. This law was passed in 1983 in Ohio. And it actually provided, collective bargaining provided for the public's health, safety, and welfare. And this bill, Senate Bill 5, eliminated, is aimed at eliminating collective bargaining. Uh, it would not only prohibit the state from being involved at this point in collective bargaining for the purpose of benefits and working conditions, but would also prohibit counties, cities, and other local government employers from continuing to negotiate employee benefit plans coverage and, and also to set community-based standards for public employment. What of home rule? I mean, at a state level, cities that are home rule should be able to make these decisions. This flies in the face of a constitutional right which cities have for home rule. This Senate Bill 5 has is really an attack on quality public service. It represents a destructive undermining of the compact between government and their workers. It changes the whole relationship. And it cannot do anything, cannot do a thing to improve the quality of service. Look at some of the biggest industrial corporations in America. You know, they had their battles with labor, but they also understood by having a workforce they could work with, the steel workers work with the steel industry to produce a quality steel product. The auto workers work with the auto industry to produce a quality car. In aerospace, we have some of the best technology in the world, and the industry works with unions. 
and the whole idea about being able to negotiate for your wages, to be able to negotiate for your benefits, is so that you can elevate the condition of your family and yourself. These aren't selfish people. They're people just trying to make a living. They just want to have a, a, continue to do their work, to have an opportunity to negotiate their pay, to be able to negotiate their benefits, to have benefits, so that then they can go home and put food on the table and, and maybe be able to send their children to a decent college and maybe be able to put a few dollars aside, maybe be able to save a little bit for their retirement in addition to, uh, their, um, uh, to, to a pension plan that they have at, at work. Why, why is, that's, when does that become asking for too much? I think it was Rachel Maddow the other day had a, uh, something that was, was a joke on her show where she talked about, uh, I'll paraphrase it, uh, people sit down at a table uh, you got a CEO sitting at a table and you got uh, workers and a tea party member sitting at a table and there's 12 cookies on a plate. And the CEO grabs 11 of those cookies. And then the worker goes to get that remaining cookie and the CEO says to everybody at the table, better watch that person, he's trying to take your cookie. This is what's going on in state after state. And this is actually what's happening in our economy, where it's working people who are the target of this attack. And it's not only at a state level. Every worker in America understands the downward pressure on wages, unless you're in Wall Street. Every worker in America knows that if they don't have any job security, they can't plan for anything. Every, there are so many people in America who are a single paycheck away from losing their home from losing everything they ever worked a lifetime for. And in this economy, where corporations have extraordinary power, where because of our trade agreements, we, they can move out of this country like that, we're going to further work in the, weaken the ability of workers to have a voice at a, at a state level or any place at all? Come on, America, wake up. We have to understand the implications of what's happening in Ohio and Wisconsin. We have to understand that our very way of life is at, is at risk here. That if corporations can use their influence to get state leaders to knock down workers' rights, it won't be long before every worker in America is, redu is reduced to a form of peonage. People can laugh and say, well, that can't happen. Well, you know what? I, I, I want to quote to you uh, from uh, a book that uh, by... Robert Shearer called The Great American Stick-Up. And the subtitle of it, so that you know that I'm not a partisan here, Mr. Speaker, the subtitle is it, of it, How Reagan Republicans and Clinton Democrats Enriched Wall Street While Mugging Main Street. I won't get into that too much, but I do want to quote from Mr. Shearer's book. Uh, he talks about uh, how uh, two... Uh, Univers University of California uh, economists, uh, Emmanuel Sayez and his colleague, Thomas Piketty, uh, they analyzed U.S. tax data and other supporting statistics. And they concluded that the boom of the Clinton years and afterward primarily benefited the wealthiest Americans. During Clinton's tenure from 1993 to 2000, the income of the top 1% shot up at an astounding rate of 10.1 percent per year, while the income of the other 99 percent of Americans increased only 2.4 percent annually. In 2002 to 2006, the next surge of the boom that Clinton's policies unleashed, the numbers were even more unbalanced. The average annual income for the bottom 99 percent increased by only 1 percent per annum, while the top 1 percent saw a gain of 11 percent each year. Further, just as the good times of the Bush years saw almost three out of every four dollars in increased income go to the wealthiest one percent, the GOP cut taxes for the richest brackets. So, as I said at the beginning, the whole economy is being converted to an engine that takes the wealth of America and puts it in the hands of a few. How can you maintain a democracy that way? 
an economic democracy is a, pre is a precondition of a political democracy. The minute we start attacking what people, what they make, the minute we start putting pressure on people's wages, and, and keep in mind, it's okay with Wall Street to have 15 million Americans under work, uh, out of work. Why? Because that creates a big labor supply which does what? Keeps wages down. So instead of having a full employment economy, which really ought to be what we should expect in a democracy that sort of everyone who wants to work has a place. We have 15 million workers uh, out of work, 12 million underemployed, but Wall Street keeps making more and more money. We're being told there's a recovery, but it's a jobless recovery. And so in this morass, we see an attack on public workers. You have to recognize exactly what's going on here. This is still another attempt to grab more assets from the people and put it into the hands of a few. Just think what can happen in Ohio if the state legislature goes ahead and passes SB5, if the state house passes it, the governor signs in a law, we just set the stage for massive privatization which will reduce service, increase its costs, and put money into the hands of private corporations. More wealth going to the top. Less ability for workers to defend their interests. And these are people working for us. State workers, city, county workers, they're the government. I mean, they are the ones who provide service. I served at a local level, Mr. Speaker. I was a councilman. I served as a mayor. I served at that local government where government is really close to people. It provides an opportunity where people can get on the phone and say, hey, Mr. Councilman, we need somebody who's going to fix this street. Take care of it. Well, there's political accountability. You get enough calls, it's not taken care of, you won't be reelected. But that control that comes from people in the neighborhoods to City Hall, when you break unions and you set the stage for privatization of their jobs, you break that. You break the tie. Then it's the government at the top that has to deal with the corporations to make sure their workers are doing right by the people. The, the essence of democracy is accountability. The essence of democracy is that people have the ability to be able to contact their government and be able to change conditions if they don't like it. And they also the essence is service. People pay taxes, they should get something in return. And yet the public workers who are being, um, who are being attacked in Ohio and Wisconsin and other places uh, are the focal point of a great debate over whether or not we will continue to have something that we call government of the people. All across this country, Mr. Speaker, there are governors who are facing budget shortfalls. And they're watching events very carefully in Ohio and Wisconsin to be able to determine how far they're going to go. We're looking at cutbacks in pension benefits, cutbacks in health benefits, some of which the representative of the workers are actually agreeing on in order to keep the jobs. But we're also looking at this parallel attempt to knock out bargaining rights. What does one have to do with the other? If people don't have the right to collective bargaining, they don't have a right to a sense of agency in dealing with governments, they're just reduced to nothing. Why do we do that to people who serve us? Why should we do that? And why shouldn't we be calling to an accounting those public officials who, by and large, will be representing corporate interest or corporate thinking? You know, there are those who think that the interest of Corporations and the government are one and the same. Oh, no, they're not. Government exists to provide service. Corporations exist to make a profit. 
fine. But let's not, you know, let's make sure we understand there's a difference. Government does not exist to make a profit, but it does provide a service. And when government resources are starting to be eroded, eroded, we have to ask why. I'll give you an idea here, Mr. Speaker. Can I ask how much time I have remaining, by the way? The gentleman has 25 minutes remaining. We're being, we're being told that there's just not enough money anymore. Let's look for a moment at our monetary system itself. When you go to a bank and you take out a loan, uh, the bank will, will book that as an asset. Banks for years and years have been using a um, a device known as a fractional reserve where they're able to create for every dollar they book as, as, a, as, a, as cash that they claim to have, they're able to create another nine dollars or even ten, maybe more. And that device known as a fractional reserve has given our banking system essentially the money to create uh, the ability to create money out of nothing. Now there's some people who are okay with that. They say, well, you know, banks have to have this ability. But when banks have that ability, we also know that banks have been prone to being able to make transactions when they got involved as some bank in Cle as a bank in Cleveland did on uh, mortgage-backed securities, and they began investing heavily, actually investing money they didn't have. When the market collapsed, the bank collapsed. So, th so th this, this device, a fractional reserve, actually, in this economy, has ended up helping to fuel speculation. Now, what about the Fed? The Fed, which this Congress has tried many times, and I've worked with Mr. Paul on this, the Fed has... Tr has virtually no controls whatsoever, limited accountability. When the Federal Reserve Act was passed in 1913, it really took out of the hands of this Congress uh, the ability to have control over the monetary system. Now, this Constitution of the United States, which I carry with me, Article 1, Section 8, Congress has the ability to coin money. Now, to coin money doesn't mean just to make coins. It actually means to create money, to, to publish money. That was a foundational principle of the ability of Congress to have a role in, in the money system. We basically sent that over to the Fed with the 1913 Federal Reserve Act. So the Fed, through another device known as quantitative easing, I want everyone to remember this, quantitative easing. What does it mean? It means the Fed has the ability to create money out of nothing to the tune of trillions of dollars, four trillion dollars in this uh, most recent uh, economic crisis. Now we're told that, un uh, that um, unless the Fed can do this, our economy would, would collapse. I think it's time we started to look at these institutions which we've created and ask if this isn't the time for us to take control on behalf of the American people to critically analyze the fractional reserve system and see if it has any, any more viability, if it doesn't really expose us to more problems than it ends up uh, creating. I, I personally think that it's time to challenge the fractional reserve system to the point of where you let banks loan the money that they actually have on deposit instead of creating money out of nothing and then if the bank goes down we have to bail them out. I think it's time for us to take the Fed which has been out of our reach and put it under the control of Treasury again. And then if the government needs to invest money and we do then we invest the money. Then we spend it into circulation. 
We're told right now we don't have any money. We don't have any money to fix our roads. There's over $2 trillion of infrastructure needs. States don't have any money. That's what we're told. That's why we're told they're having this conflict with the workers. They're out of money. We don't have any money to fix up our roads. Well, FDR figured out what to do in the New Deal. You just create a WPA, you put millions of people back to work, you rebuild America. We're apparently not going to go in that direction, but why not? We're told we don't have the money. What, we have to borrow it from banks? Who's holding our securities? <laughs> if we can borrow money from Japan and from China and from the UK and from the Cayman Islands to manage our economy, well, if we can borrow money to keep wars going, hello, why can't we spend the money into circulation, take back the power, which inherently is in the Constitution, and invest in the creation of jobs again, and put those 15 million Americans back to work, create a revenue-sharing program for the states so states aren't faltering anymore, have a national health care system so you don't have to worry about health care being on the bargaining table, absolutely make Social Security solid so there's never a question about a partial privatization, which is another agenda some people would like to run here. It's not like we don't have within our grasp an ability to change the conditions in which we're operating. But instead, we have this poverty mentality which rivets us to control by corporate interests who are making money hand over fist, who we're being told all of America's poor except Wall Street, Huh? How did that happen? With our money, nonetheless, how did that happen? Why is an unemployment a problem on Wall Street? Think about this. Why is Wall Street doing better than ever? Why do we hear these dark tales about speculations happening again? Are we getting ready for another pump and dump scheme? We'll be back here in a few years having to bail out Wall Street again. Meanwhile, Main Street's infrastructure crumbles. Main Street's workers are hungry for work. Main Street's wages are getting depressed. Main Street's struggling for health care. Main Street's worried about its pension. Main Street's worried about whether they're going to have a home or not. What's happening in Ohio and Wisconsin is relevant because every single economic issue which is facing this nation today is part of that debate. Why should we accept an economy where people are told they have limited expectations? This is America. We have the ability to, we have shown the world the ability to create untold wealth. But if we keep shipping it offshore, why shouldn't people who have an education, who have strived to achieve a middle class standard of living, why shouldn't they expect that their government will stand next to them? It's time for people to understand that we need to take a strong stand in favor of the rights of workers. Now, how do we do that? Let's look at our trade agreements, Mr. Speaker. Every trade agreement needs to be renegotiated. We need to renegotiate NAFTA and the General Agreement on Tariff and Trade and China Trade, and we need to say that every single trade agreement has the right to collective bargaining. We're going in the wrong direction in the state. Every agreement we have should have the right to collective bargaining. The right, the right to
And so uh, we have to, uh, to find other people who buy our treasury bills, and that's the Chinese government. So China is our borrower of record, our lender of record. And so we would uh, watch what the Chinese have said in the past uh, couple of months, in the past couple of years. And a couple of times China has said we're not going to buy any more of the treasury bills from the United States government. At one point they said we'll buy South Korean treasury bills, meaning the South Korean uh, government was a better bet than, than the U.S. government. And so our banker has been giving us signs that we're concerned. We're concerned about this economic health of your country because they see that we cannot long continue. Now, for myself, I've gone ahead and done the mathematics that uh, if you are spending 3.5, you're bringing in 2.2, while you are running a deficit of $1.3 trillion uh, every year. Now, that's a deficit as long as it's un, uh, unaccounted for, as long as it hasn't been spent. But the moment that the money spends, then it goes into the debt barrel, and that's the top small barrel, and we have a debt of approximately $15 trillion, might be a little bit less. To put that in perspective, that debt barrel began to build uh, in the early days of our history, and we accumulated up to $5 trillion worth of debt to the second President Bush, uh, George uh, W. Bush. And during his term, we increased that debt from 5 to basically 10. So a, a very rapid escalation of debt accumulation during the, the, the uh, second Bush years. But then under President Obama, then we have seen an acceleration even faster. Uh, so that we, we've already added almost another $5 trillion in debt in, in, in two and a half years under President Obama, and we're on track to maybe add another six or seven, maybe eight, in, uh, in the next two years. Uh, this 1.3 deficit uh, for this coming year, that was last year. This coming year, that number becomes $1.6 trillion. So you can see that, that the gap between what we're bringing in and what we're spending is absolutely increasing rather than decreasing. Uh, now, to put this in a bigger perspective, the last year of President Bush, the, uh, the deficit was about $200 billion, so instead of 1.3, it was about 0 0.2. If we round it off to 0 0.3, you could see that, that almost immediately under President Obama that we went to, uh, we increased our deficit, that is, we increased these outlays by almost a trillion dollars so that uh, our economic condition is worsening very rapidly. Now, the unsettling piece is, is the, I mean, if you look at the $15 trillion in the top debt barrel, and then you look at the revenues that, uh, that we're bringing in from the government, you say, well, we could pay off seven or eight years. If we weren't spending a thing, we could uh, pay off for seven or eight years and still not have quite all of our debt paid off. Uh, but then the alarming piece is this fiscal gap at the bottom. That is Social Security, Medicare, and Medicaid. And when we consider those elements, then we're looking at a $202 trillion deficit, a debt, a debt that we owe. Those are mandated spending programs that we're not going to turn off. And so we can, can already understand that we would pay almost 100 years uh, if we were only getting $2.2 trillion uh, into, this, into paying off this fiscal gap that we, uh, that we experience here. Now, over in the far right corner of the chart, uh, we see now a graph, and, and the thing about graphs is they go on in time. This bottom line, the horizontal line, is, is actually years, and the, the vertical line then is, is representative of the average income per capita income that we as Americans have had through our history. And so I ask uh, our listeners always, are you doing better than your parents did? And Almost always, the, the answer is yes, I make more money than my parents did, and I myself uh, made more money than my parents did. And, and that's shown on this chart, that every year the, the chart has been increasing. As we go through time, the, the numbers increase, and so it, it shows that. But then we see that, uh, that the chart levels off and starts down. And so when I ask people right now, are your children going to live better than you? Are your children going to have more income than you did? And very few people in a, in a room will raise their hand that's because they see that the economic condition of the world is getting worse, not better, and that worsening condition is based simply on these factors right here. There's nothing in the world economies that would not improve if we didn't solve these problems, and so it does not have to be we could continue that growth curve forever. So we're right now at the point where the curve flattens off and moves down uh, in, into a lower category, 
But at the very tip of that curve is a red dot, and then the curve stops. And discerning people would say, well, I thought graphs just continue. You draw them on out through infinity. Well, you do, except this chart stops. And this chart stops because our economy literally shows both Office of Management and Budget, the White House, and the CBO, that's the uh, congressional arm. So both the White House and the Congress both show the same chart that our economies simply cease to function about 2037. Now, uh, for the people who are younger than myself, that's in your lifetimes. I may not see that, but my children and grandchildren will see this point where our economy quits. That's what happened in the Soviet Union. President Reagan believed that if he simply increased our spending enough on, on arms that he could cause them to, con to continue to invest more spending on arms. They would not be able to increase the revenues. They would have this gap right here. Their deficits would increase. Their debt would increase. And eventually, the system would implode. It would collapse on itself. And that's what's happening in our economy in 2037. So at this particular point in our time, we have to stop and say, we can't continue this. We must begin to do differently. And that's what the House was doing last week. Now, many in the country have said, oh, they're draconian cuts. We should not have done that. You shouldn't have cut that deeply. And others are saying, you should have cut more. So let's evaluate that very briefly. And we cut basically about $60 billion out of the, the, uh, the budget. Uh, we cut it out of the continuing resolution uh, a couple of weeks ago when we passed that bill. And so what does $60 billion mean in this chart? 60 billion would mean that you change this number from 3.5 to 3.44. And we're still faced with only the 2.2 here in revenues to the country. And I would ask every listener in the audience, is that significant? Is it draconian? And, and if you think it's draconian, would your banker think it's draconian? And almost everyone laughs if I ask them, would you, if you were spending 3,500 a month, bringing in 2,200 a month, and you went to your banker, would your banker think that you made significant cuts if you cut from 3,500 to 3,440? And most people laugh and say, my banker wouldn't talk to me if I only cut that much. And so uh, I put it into that context that we did not do significant cuts, and yet the, uh, the, many of the people here in Washington are, are wailing and weeping and gnashing of teeth, those sorts of uh, things that catastrophe just awaits us, because we cut spending by 0.06. Um, myself, I don't think so. I think that the looming economic crisis in 2037 is the more compelling point that our economy simply will cease to function out in that range. And again, you can go online and look at CBO or, or OMB to find that chart. That's where we pulled it out. And uh, so, so take a look at it. But the, the important thing is to understand that no company my wife and I ran a small company, and no company ever found itself in fiscal straits like this and cured it simply by cutting spending. I don't think that it's possible for us to cut spending from 3.5 to 2.2. As a business person, it does not ring true. It doesn't seem like that we can cut that much. And so if we can't cut that much spending, you have to say, well, then how do we get the 2.2 to move toward the 3.5? If we can't cut spending enough, then how do we grow the revenues? Now, some people will say, well, we should raise taxes. That should be... They, sh they would say we should raise taxes. And uh, then you should have to ask, well, what's the outcome of raising taxes? The first thing is to understand that there's a basic economic truth, that tax increases will kill jobs. And so if we want to make this number smaller, just increase taxes and we actually increase the difference. We, in, you know, we increase our deficit because this number actually gets smaller at that point. If we want to solve the problem that we're facing now, there's only one way to go, and that is economic growth. We need to create jobs. If we have to create jobs, then we must evaluate the ways that we're not creating jobs today. The, the two general. greatest threats to job creation.